to express my appreciation to Brother Kim for leading the song service this morning. Good job. Thank you. And also the children and the young people who sang. We appreciate them helping out with the service. This morning I want to speak to you on justification by faith without works. Now scripture is found in the book of Romans chapter 4. Chapter 4. But we're, we're going to take our scripture this morning to introduce that chapter by reading from the book of Genesis, chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. In honor of God's word, let's stand together. The scriptures are printed in your book. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he, and he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And so Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard in the tent of the Lord, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah had within herself, saying, After I am past the Lord, shall I have my Lord be And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh? saying, Shall I have a surety bear a child when I am old? Is he anything to the heart of the Lord? At the time appointed, I will be to thee, according to the time of the life, and Sarah shall have a son. Thank you. Be seated. Now we look into the book of Romans, chapter 4. And it's going to be based on par in the scripture we read in Genesis. There are six ingredients which make up saving faith. And those six ingredients are, number one, a valid content. That is, it must be a revelation of God. Secondly, a valid object. And that object has to be God, the giver of the revelation. And the third element of saving faith is that it's contrary to hope. Yet it rests upon hope. And there is no element of uncertainty in it. In the fourth place, saving faith has a purpose that he might become the father of many nations. And fifthly, faith produces works. Faith without works is dead. And sixthly, faith must have a righteousness that conforms to all that the Lord requires. Otherwise, the sinner would be saved at the expense of justice. And God's attributes never conflict with one another. Now the method of receiving justification and righteousness is by imputation. Now imputation is a big word, but it means that God credits to our account the righteousness of Christ. And that's what imputation means. Imputation is what God does for and in us. And we're going to see a lot about imputation in this chapter. That's why I'm going to take a little time and read some scriptures about imputation so you will see that imputation is a biblical doctrine. You say, well, doesn't everybody believe that? No, most people don't believe that. So I'm going to present it to you this morning because I believe it because the Bible says it. 
And I think everybody should believe what the Bible says. Let me give you some scripture on imputation. First Romans chapter 4 and verse 3. It was counted to him, that's Abraham, for righteousness. Romans 4, 5. His faith is counted for righteousness that is not as the righteousness or a substitute for righteousness, but as bringing him into righteousness. Thirdly, Romans 4, 6. Under whom God imputes righteousness without works. Fourthly, Romans 4 and verse 8. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Romans 4, 11. That righteousness might be imputed to them also. And Romans 4.24, to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. And then six, 2 Corinthians 5.19, not imputing their trespasses unto them. And then Galatians 3.6, it was accounted to him for righteousness. That means imputed to him. And then Paul says in Philippians 3 and verse 9, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Now the subject of Romans chapter 11 is justification by faith through the imputation of righteousness. And I want to give you an outline as I begin this study. First of all, justification illustrated verses 1 through 4. Secondly, justification defined verses 5 through 8. Thirdly, justification apart from ordinances, verses 9 through 12. And fourthly, justification apart from the law and by grace through faith, verses 13 through 16. Then fifthly, justification by believing the impossible, verses 17 through 22. And sixthly, justification by Abraham, was the same as ours today. Verses 23 through 25. Now I'll go through each one of those points with you this morning. The Apostle Paul begins his thesis by appealing to two men that were highly respected in Israel by the Jews. First of all, the Jews regarded Abraham and David as the two greatest men in their history. And of course, anything those two men said would be absolutely correct with the Jewish people. So Paul is going to show them that their two greatest men agrees with him that justification is by grace through faith without the works of the law, which they have been doing, trying to practice the works of the law for justification. So Paul quotes about 60 times from the Old Testament. Abraham was the founder of the Hebrew race. And David was Israel's greatest king. Abraham was justified by faith 430 years before the law was ever given. So he couldn't have been justified by the law because there was no law in Abraham's day. It wasn't given until 430 years later. And the second thing about David being Israel's greatest king, he was under the law. He came later. And he came under the law because when he was born, the law was in effect. Now this leads us to our first point. Justification <coughs> illustrated by these two men. Justification is proved by Abraham, and he begins with verse 1. I hope you have your Bible open and follow me in these scriptures. What shall we say then, that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? 
That is, what, what did he attain by his own efforts? Actually, nothing. For if Abraham were justified by works, he has whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Now, what is the it in verse 3? It was counted unto him. God placed a deposit of righteousness in the account of Abraham. In other words, God said, Abraham, I'm going to account you as righteous. I'm going to bestow upon you the righteousness of my son, Jesus Christ. And therefore, you will now have his righteousness instead of your own righteousness. Abraham believed God and accepted what God told him. Now, we need to be very careful with this. Because faith is not righteousness. Faith receives righteousness. So if faith receives righteousness, then it couldn't be righteousness. There are two different commodities. Abraham believed and God made Abraham righteous. Faith is the gift of God. Faith is the hand that reaches out and takes the gift that God offers. God offers the gift of righteousness and the sinner reaches out his hand and receives